let me preface by saying this. The reason we started looking at serotonin in motor neuron disease is because although we have seen routinely improvements, meaning functional gains, I struggle. And as a center, we struggle at speech improvements and swallowing. Right. And so the question then is, what is controlling speech and swallowing? Right. Um, what is that related to very specifically? And because there have been a number of research studies proposed looking at serotonin and increasing serotonin, uh, then for us, for the last maybe three, four months, it's become a big focus. And what I would tell you going into this, um, it's an area that we've been focusing on. And as a result, we're seeing improvements in that area, right, uh, of serotonin involved functional changes. And so it made sense at this point to start at least sharing what's out there. Okay, number one. So I recognize again, I possibly make the ugliest slides available. Uh, it doesn't change. I think what we're looking at over here is some really, really important information. And so number one is this part in the center. You are looking at it. 2018 is describing in ALS, it has been hypothesized that serotonergic denervation, right? So serotonin related uh, denervation or loss of, of neurons in an area leads to the loss of inhibitory control on glutamate release, resulting in glutamate induced neurotoxicity in both lower and upper motor neurons. Here's what we're talking about. We know glutamine and glutamate toxicity is a hallmark of motor neuron disease, just like the misfolding of the transcription protein TDP43. We know medications like Rilazole are used to try and control that glutamine or glutamate toxicity. It is interesting, right, to see the role that serotonin is playing in that same area and most people that we have seen. So if I had to categorize that, I would tell you it's got to be 90%, if not, if not more, will describe that prior to the onset of motor neuron disease, prior to the onset of their first symptom, within one year and on the outside of that, within two years, they had a very stressful, very difficult, very sad or very anxiety-driven situation in their life, whether it was the loss of somebody that they loved whether it was the loss of a job, whether it was stress in a relationship. And so I have been wondering for quite some time, what is the role of that episode of sadness or depression or anxiety? And why do we routinely see that happening prior to motor neuron symptoms well, within a year? on the outside again within two years, but it's almost always within a year. And for some people, it's shorter within two, three, four months. And so we know serotonin plays a role. And to that point, and switching away from science and just talking about uh, practical things that can be done, the best defense when it comes to controlling progression for motor neuron disease that we have found is not medicine. It is mindset and happiness. The best defense to protect motor neurons looks to be happiness, right? And so whether that is meditation and finding kind of a calm mind, whether that is laughter therapy. So you actually start laughing out loud, right? So you make yourself laugh even more, whether it's just watching something funny, uh, whether it's having just a happy time with people that you love. But what we know is happiness seems to protect motor neurons and the converse is true. Depression and anxiety look to cause progression. And now we know really what the role is. At the very bottom of the screen, platelet serotonin levels, platelet serotonin levels predict survival in ALS. Now, that's a 2010 article, meaning this is not new. It's new. We as a center hadn't been focusing on it uh, as far as therapeutically, what do we want to do about it? But this is not a new concept, right? We know the role that serotonin plays. Okay, and most recently, a grant that is in the process of being evaluated, linking not so much serotonin to ALS, but more specifically, serotonin to speech and swallowing in ALS. And ever since we as a center uh, kind of got our arms around that whole construct, 
again, about three to four months, we have been very focused on that pathway, not just serotonin, but the relationship of dopamine to serotonin therapies that we use typically as IVs to try and restore that balance. Okay, I'm going to say something that is very technical, uh, just for the clinicians that are on the uh, call, just to kind of get a sense. We are not trying to just put serotonin on board. That that doesn't look to work. Uh, although we do know that medications that increase serotonin, methylene blue, new dexta, just as two examples, uh, look to improve certain symptoms of motor neuron disease, new dexta, which can increase serotonin, no surprise, it can also improve speech and swallowing. All right, here's the technical part. Remember, you're talking in serotonin about a 5-HTP pathway. Here's what that means. When you have the ingredients to make serotonin, serotonin is made primarily in the gut, but the part that you need in your brain is made in the brain, a very small percent, but based on the nutrients, the ingredients, the building blocks that you need. And with that in mind, I am putting together a serotonin focused diet because I recognize that really is the next step for this. When the body has the ingredients, so if you don't have the ingredients, then you can't properly make serotonin, period. But if you do have the ingredients and the body does not want to be happy, let's say, lots of inflammation, lots of stress, not getting a lot of sleep, the body is not going to be cooperating, right? It's not like a, you're going to make serotonin and you can't force a body to make it, or at least we have not found a way to do that. So instead you want to recruit a body's willingness to make serotonin because we are now talking clinically about the kyanorenin pathway, meaning if somebody is under stress, you are looking at a brain that is not going to be interested in making happiness. And so you are not going to take those ingredients and make happiness. You're not going to move down the 5-HTP pathway when you're looking at tryptophan. Instead, you are going to make quinolinic acid, which does not, of course, result in serotonin or happiness. It, in, it, it results in sadness, anxiety, and depression. So now, coming away from that, the clinical part, and coming back for all of us, what you're doing for happiness is more important than trying to force a brain just with medication to want to make serotonin. You are not, in our estimation as a center, going to overcome the intention of a body if lots of inflammation, not a lot of sleep, feeling aggravated all the time, uh, having something that makes you angry, right? It is not a situation where you are just going to make serotonin, right? Because you're going to choose as a brain to stay in that kind of sad, anxious place. And so as a result, you will make quinolinic acid. Right? And so the goal going back to laughter therapy, doing things that you love. Uh, if in, in your life, you're not or you haven't created boundaries to make sure that you're not feeling sad or bad, you need to do that, right? Because serotonin, you're looking at three different areas, three different links, but the one on top is the driver. Because again, we had folks where we saw improvements in speech and swallowing, but I could not nail down the reason. Looking at the data now, looking at the information now, it's because the serotonin pathway is so critical to that. And again, just using new dexta as an example, directly in the world of motor neuron disease, commonly it's going to improve pseudobulbar or mood changes. That's what you would expect with serotonin. However, it's also modifying and oftentimes improving speech and swallowing. And you wouldn't expect that for serotonin, but now we know it to be uh, something that is in the serotonin related area of motor neuron change.